Welcome to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast. Your chance to learn about the teachings of the Catholic Church on sacred music, both in theory and practice, through interviews, discussions, and music. Your hearts and minds will be lifted up and better understand what it means to sing the praise of His glory. And now, your host, Dr. Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast, and the official podcast of the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music. I'm joined today by my friend, Dr. Eric Arenas, who teaches at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music after having completed his PhD in musicology at Stanford. We discuss the tradition of so-called Viennese orchestral masses, and then focus in on Franz Josef Haydn's younger brother, Michael, and his requiem for Archbishop Sigismund. This is the last episode of season six. We hope you've enjoyed this season, and we'll be back later in the fall after our summer term wraps up at the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music. If you're not joining us this summer for a class, we ask that you pray for our students and for our work in building up the church through a renewal of her sacred music. We hope you enjoy the show and see you again soon. Eric, it's great to have you on the show today. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. I'm glad to be with you. So you specialize in the concerted masses of the 18th century that most musicians usually refer to as the Viennese tradition. Is this moniker accurate? And what sorts of musical diversity do you see as includable with the masses of Haydn and Mozart that we usually think of? Well, it's a good question. It's it's a, a, a big question, too, uh, because in the 18th century, Vienna was indeed one of the leading centers, if not the leading center, for the composition and performance of concerted settings of the mass. So that is choral mass settings that incorporate orchestral writing uh, and often also solo voices. Uh, so a, a vast repertoire of, of such works was cultivated within its most prestigious ecclesiastical institutions, particularly the Cathedral of St. Stephen and the Court of the Habsburg Monarchs, and they were very you know, interconnected institutions. And the, and the Habsburg Monarchs, uh, as is well known, usually presided also as emperors of the Holy Roman Empire, so they had this imperial uh, cultural tradition behind them. Uh, so this kind of music and variants of it uh, was, was, was also cultivated to different degrees in many secular and ecclesiastical courts and monastic institutions in the wider Viennese cultural orbit. But the most prominent of these sustain their own core repertories and practices. So the label Viennese Mass is sometimes overextended uh, to include some of this music. The, the, so the most prominent case in point is uh, is that of, of Mozart, uh, who composed in Salzburg during the late 18th century. So many of his, or just about all of his masses, have been attached to the, the Viennese repertoire because they entered the Viennese repertoire eventually, because there was a lot of cross-pollinization between the practices of these cities, even though they were still they could still be very distinct. Now, at the same time, uh, the masses composed by uh, Joseph Haydn in the same era obtained prominence as quote unquote Viennese works generally, despite the fact that many of them were not written for performance in Vienna either. Uh, and then his brother, uh, Michael Haydn, worked in Salzburg as well and, and represents a similar situation. The, all three of these composers ultimately. Uh, entered the Viennese repertoire, or, or they had roots in Vienna, in the case of the Haydn's, and uh, and had some influence there. But their prominence tends to obscure the multitude of liturgical works by composers who did mainly work in Vienna, uh, most of whom are you know, generally over overshadowed or unknown. Uh, so the the casual label Viennese mass or the masses in the Viennese tradition uh, has been prone to some inaccuracy uh, or inadequateness uh, over the years. So I would say that it's more accurate and appropriate to understand the concerted orchestral mass of this era as a broader genre that indeed has its roots in Viennese culture and arguably its largest flourishing there, but it was cultivated in distinctive ways across Austrian and German Catholic musical centers. 
So could I ask you, besides the three composers, which you've named the brothers Haydn and Mozart, who else are some prominent composers that fall into this broader tradition? Well, as far as their contemporaries, uh, some notable composers were uh, uh, Johann Georg Albrechtsberger, who was better known in this time as a as a pedagogue and teacher, uh, but was in, in their time also highly regarded as a composer and prominent in church music. Uh, and then the opera composer Antonio Salieri made a significant contribution to the Viennese repertoire. And then there are even uh, further composers like Leopold Hoff, Hoffmann, and then especially earlier composers uh, who were active uh, a generation before are largely forgotten, but they remained prominent in in the repertoire for decades and decades. So especially a figure like uh, Georg Reuter or Georg von Reuter II, uh, who had been the Kapellmeister of the cathedral and also at the court uh, for overlapping periods of time. Uh, he, he wrote a lot of music in many, many settings of the Mass, uh, me- some of which remained in the active repertoire for a century. Wow. When I studied in Vienna, I found that uh, Masses archived uh, in the National Library. Uh, bore performance dates uh, on the cover, which somebody helpfully notated. One mass that sticks in my mind that had performance dates stretching from its composition in about 1742 through 1800, and then in possibly an updated version of the piece up till the 1840s. Wow, that's incredible. And I mean, hardly anyone is probably doing (laughs) his masses now. I mean, have you seen recent performances of his works? No, not even in Vienna. And the problem is that these masses are not published, so they're just hard to obtain. So uh, as part of my dissertation research, I just had to transcribe quite a few of them because I wanted to see what they were like and hear what they sounded like or have a basic sense for them. Yeah. Yeah, It's still only a drop in the bucket. Yeah. So I know that, you know, you are a practicing church musician as well and have a very strong sense of the musical shape of the liturgy, um, serving as you do as the assistant to um, Dr. Mart in the St. Anne Choir. And so I'm sure you're keenly aware of the criticisms about this repertory in the liturgy. What are some of the complaints that um, we see in the time of their composition about this music? Were they complaining in the same way as the the modern sensibility might? Uh, Yes, there there are many connections. Most of the criticisms revolve around issues of propriety and style, uh, and then also, uh, in in a certain sense, uh, about the practicality. Uh, So with regard to the practicality first, uh, you know, it is... uh, it is challenging to put together this kind of music because it requires a very good choir as well as an orchestra and and often soloists. Uh, and and even in the in the time in the 18th century, there were phases uh, during which ecclesiastical authorities and court authorities were uneasy with the amount of effort that it took to put on such pieces, uh, just to you know to employ the musicians and and. Uh, uh, especially if if it caused the liturgy to be be longer. Uh, so famously in in Vienna, I think it was in the 1770s, the imperial or the emperor Joseph II had tried to scale back. Well, even earlier, his mother, the Empress Maria Theresia, had tried to scale back music, but it, they could never completely suppress the music. That is a whole complicated chapter uh, uh, in in that history as well. But the 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 genre of the concerted mass and other types of uh, elaborate liturgical music persisted, uh, certainly. And then uh, there are you know many other instances of, of authorities trying to, to scale these things back. A good uh, and sometimes misunderstood case is that of the Archbishop in Salzburg, Archbishop Colorado, who is known to uh, for for trying to scale back on this kind of music. But interestingly, when you read his documents, uh, which which dictate this, the scaling back of church music, he is making this point mainly for parish churches, but still recognizing that this is the way music is carried out at the court and cathedral and in certain prestigious churches, collegiate churches mainly. Uh, so I think the concern was, was mainly that, uh, well, in the case of 
Salzburg, Colorado, strongly thought that that smaller churches, parish churches, shouldn't be going through all of this trouble to put on this more princely music. So that's uh, you know a little bit about about the practicality, uh, which is you know, something that can, is easily related to you know in later times. Uh, the the issues of propriety are more complicated. So we have a lot or a number of accounts of uh, visitors to Vienna taking in music at church services and commenting negatively on uh, the elaborateness of the music and sometimes the the worldliness of the music. And that has often been then associated in retrospect with the the concerted mass repertoire that is still well known and uh, uh, obtainable. So again, these same types of works by Mozart and the Haydn's. But there's a problem there because we don't really know what these visitors were listening to because it was a vast repertoire uh, being performed on a weekly basis in Vienna. And so they probably weren't listening to these masses, or if they heard them, they were, it was in the midst of many other pieces. And the repertoire did extend at this time to works that uh, that employed operatic contrafacta, for instance. So the importation of operatic tunes, popular op- operatic tunes for, for sacred pieces. But composers like Mozart and the Haydn's didn't do that. They tended not to do that. And, and so, and so it's really just difficult to to line up these these criticisms with, with these pieces. And this is something that music historians have done that I've, I've quite often that I've found to be very faulty. Is has made that association with the the repertoire that we're we're focusing yeah, on. Yeah, can I can I insert a question there? So, like, can you distinguish for us some helpful things to listen to? Maybe for the more sophisticated listener, I'm not maybe thinking about the the less sophisticated listener who's just going to hear it as operatic no matter what. But let's say that a more sophisticated listener is trying to distinguish between an operatic aria style and uh, the second Agnus Dei of Mozart. Or is it is it not easily distinguishable on a on a section like that that really is more operatic in style, and then he has a more um, sacred style in other parts to buttress around that operatic style? Yeah, I mean you're you're on the right track there. It, a lot of this has to do with the the balance of of styles. So. It's uh, it's pretty clear that composers of the 18th century, your that is your serious church music composers who had significant jobs in church music, and this includes very much Mozart and Michael Haydn, uh, because they worked for the cathedral in, in Salzburg. But they wrote pieces which were not of extraordinary length for reasons I won't get into now. That's a whole other thorny history, but they're of a very practical length, and they are conceived of as mainly choral pieces, you can argue. And so the Im- importation of styles that you hear in an uh, in operatic or symphonic writing, uh, you can perceive them as very measured. And so, yes, so any aria-style singing does tend to be bookended by choral passages and, and then also balanced by healthy use of fugato writing to invoke the, the polyphonic heritage, which right. is uh, which is always uh, a major ingredient and something that's that may be easy to overlook because it is embedded in a, a more flashy 18th century orchestral style, but it's there. Yeah. And certainly, you know, in, in the operas of Mozart, whenever a, a fugato style appears, it it almost always has some sort of hearkening trying to sound like church music. So it's clear that he intended that as a churchy sound, right? Right. Yeah, it, so it's true that there was, you know, to put it very basically, they, they had a, a, a churchy, you know, uh, facet, you know, to their craft. They did. Even composers, I think, who were not active in church music, tried uh, to maintain a, a an ecclesiastical style, even if they didn't do so as uh, as successfully. In, in those cases, they might just not, might might not be able to pull off a fugue very well, or or lots of contrapuntal writing. And and so it it is this this balance of ingredients that you really have to look for in in judging whether a piece is really you know operatic in its style because the fact of the matter is if you listen to any of Mozart's masses or Haydn's uh, Michael Haydn's masses especially they're they're even though they're using these worldly elements which are the you know current 
styles favored in the aristocratic culture, uh, they're, they're still not writing the way they would for an opera. Right. Yeah. Can I come back to this issue of regulations? You know, I think people who haven't studied the governorship of Joseph II might be really (laughs) shocked to see the level of detail in which he stipulated regulations for the churches in the empire. Could you give us just a little bit of a taste of that and perhaps how they particularly affected other um, people in in power and, uh, you know, just the, the musical regulations? Uh, well, I don't re- recall as much about this, the specific regulations in Vienna under Joseph II, uh, but also his uh, his uh, predecessor, his mother, uh, the Empress Maria Theresa. But there, there was a uh, over a, a kind of a, a phase of some length. There was an attempt to uh, to, as I mentioned before, rein in celebrations, and and so they they tried to to do this on various fronts. So cutting back on uh, feast days or the, the the elaborate celebration of feast days, cutting back on processions and a lot of public devotions. So these are things outside of the mass, but then yes, within the mass, uh, uh, a turning back to simpler types of music. So uh, more choral music or what they would have called, well, uh, sometimes acapella music as they would have called it. And, uh, but or sometimes what was termed ordinary music. So this is a, a complicated question to answer because uh, you need to understand that at the Viennese court, they maintain this distinction between musical styles and usages, which is not unusual for the time, uh, which is that that uh, on the simplest feast days, or the I'm sorry, we're speaking in, in terms of uh, so like the uh, uh, the class of feast uh, on. On uh, lesser feast days, you used simpler music, on a, and on more elaborate feast days, you used more elaborate music. Well, that's of course you know a, a typical way of uh, of elaborating the liturgy. But it, the extra complication in a place like Vienna and in other places was that they used the most elaborate music not just for the most important feast days because they were the most important feast days. But because the most important feast days generally were also of some significance politically. And so if there was a public mass attended by the court, and so if if the emperor, empress, or the imperial family were in attendance, they would use the most elaborate music uh, then. And this is by, uh, by regulation. And so this is what they called solemn music, because usually the mass was quite solemn. And so there's a bar- the borrowing of this term. So there was a, and this this type of music had at its hallmark the use of trumpets and drums, which was a hallmark of of a sovereign prince musically. Uh, and in fact, there was an old imperial regulation which was still maintained towards the end of the 18th century that only a sovereign prince could use trumpets and drums in this kind of events. So, uh, and, and exceptions to that were exceptions. They were, there were exceptions, but, uh, but the, this is, but the sound of trumpets and drums was the sound of a court. And so there, it was, there was mainly a cutting back on this kind of music, the most courtly music, the, the, the big public music with trumpets and drums, uh, which required so many more uh, musicians to bring together. Can I can I insert a a, a pointed question here? Then uh, clearly, those instruments in particular are taken uh, to task by Benedict the Fourteenth and Anus Cui. And what was the reaction of Maria Theresa to <laughs> this um, regulation issued by Pope Benedict the Fourteenth? Well, that's a, a very good question because uh, what played out in Vienna at that that time or in the aftermath of that that document demonstrates that she was sympathetic to these reforms and they uh, kind of served what is generally uh, perceived to be a more uh, frugal uh, approach by Maria Theresa uh, and her court uh, they, that it, they had no problem scaling back that they uh, and and it's it must be remembered as well that they had just come through a bruising war of succession and uh, and I've made the argument in present uh, pres- other presentations that the use of uh, the very traditional uh, elaborate music with trumpets and drums was very important during the war years. But then after that was all settled, 
they were happy to to scale back on the elaborate liturgies and save save money and and time, uh, even though Maria Theresa was a very devout empress. Uh, it was just that it, she has a reputation for not being so interested in the big, flashy public type of liturgy. Uh, neither she nor uh, her husband, who was her consort as Austrian monarch, but he actually was the emperor in, uh, uh, at that point. And so there are some uh, really interesting episodes in this history, uh, which demonstrate the fact that this was not a reform that was entirely welcome in the, the sphere of church musicians and the clergy at this time, uh, because we have uh, one example, uh, I forget what, which year it was now, but the, the empress had become ill and then recovered, and, and the Archbishop of Vienna, I believe it was, uh, decided that he really wanted to uh, have a big liturgy to, to celebrate in Thanksgiving for her recovery. And so they had to petition to use all the, the trumpets and drums and the elaborate music, and I believe that petition was approved. Uh, so it uh, so they they scaled back, but I, as I said before, this the tradition persisted, and it was something that was uh, still considered traditional. And so it's it's not surprising that it it never completely subsided and was uh, maintained as as well as as could be wherever it could be in, in the Viennese orbit. Yeah, can we focus in on uh, Franz Josef Haydn's younger brother Mikhail, who lived from 1737 to 1806. Could you tell us a little bit about his musical upbringing? Yeah. So Michael Haydn followed a, a path uh, into music that, uh, that was similar to his, his older brother, uh, the much better known now, Franz Josef Haydn, uh, and much better known in their lifetime, certainly. They were both uh, boy choristers at the Cathedral of St. Stephen in Vienna. They had been recruited to sing there uh, after growing up in their earliest years in Lower Austria in a more rural setting. And we know that Josef Haydn was recruited by the Kapellmeister, the director of music at, at the cathedral, who was traveling in the uh, the town where they grew up. Or rather, I got ahead of myself a little bit, uh, Josef Haydn had moved from their hometown to a nearby town to study music with a cousin uh, who was a teacher there and I think director of music at a, a parish church. And it was there that he was connected with the Kapellmeister of the cathedral who uh, heard him sing and recruited him and took him to Vienna to join the choir there. Uh, so that story we know, we don't have, know the specific story of how Michael Haydn then ended up following the same path, but he did. He, he was then, uh, he joined his brother uh, at the cathedral choir few years later. And so they sang together uh, during that time. And then sometime after or around uh, the time his voice changed, uh, he was released from the choir. This is a kind of recurring story in music history. And so uh, like Joseph Haydn, Michael Haydn had to embark on a, a freelance period to try to find a, a work or a position working for a patron. And so he eventually did. Now, the interesting divergence and parallel of, of their stories, that, that is the story of the two Haydn brothers, is that uh, Joseph Haydn famously first went to work for a, a kind of lesser known nobleman in his small court. And Michael Haydn found a job with a lesser known prince bishop and went to his court uh, in, in the East, actually in a, a Location that is now part of Romania, but which was then part of part of uh, the Kingdom of Hungary and thus part of the Austrian Empire. And then, as uh, after a few years, in the case of of Joseph Haydn, he ultimately gained a position with the Prince Esterházy, who was one of the most powerful Hungarian noblemen, and went to work for him for for much of the rest of his career. Not all of it, famously, but most of it. Uh, but then Michael Haydn ultimately uh, found employment with the Archbishop of Salzburg on the other side of Austria. And so they both went to work for very powerful patrons. But in the case of Michael Haydn, he went to work for an ecclesiastical prince. Uh, and at this point in history, an ecclesiastical prince is is just that. The prince Archbishop of Salzburg was a sovereign prince over the state uh, of Zalt the uh, Archbishopric of Salzburg. So he ruled over this territory, and it was not part of Austria. It was part of the empire. And 
they, they cultivated the, a very ample tradition of concerted masses with the trumpets and drums and all the uh, that musical style of solemnity because the prince archbishop was a, a sovereign prince. And so there they maintained a similar tradition uh, to that of Vienna, where for the most important occasions, they used the solemn style music, as they called it, with trumpets and drums. And then by degrees, they used smaller scales of music for lesser feast days. But in the case of Salzburg, it also depended on who the celebrant was. So generally on these high feast days, where, on which they used the full orchestration with trumpets and drums, the celebrant was the prince archbishop himself. So if the celebrant were not the prince archbishop, but the dean of the, the cathedral chapter or or another member, a canon of the of the chapter, uh, then they would have they would have to knock the music down a step, and so there'd be no trumpets and drums, but they might uh, they would use the violins and or organs. So the music kind of stacks up uh, by degrees. So for the simplest being a cappella style, as they would have called it, which still would have had instruments doubling voices, and then the middle type would have had strings and woodwinds. And then the fullest type would have had all of those things, plus trumpets and drums and, and uh, et cetera. Uh, and so, so then he went to work uh, for the archbishop, writing for the court lots of secular music, chamber music, symphonies, and, and such, uh, eventually. And then for the cathedral, lots of, of liturgical music of all three types that I just mentioned. Can I insert a question there about, um, you know, do you see flexibility in a single score for the instrumentation between the low, middle, and high types, or are they writing different masses in each of those types? Well, they're mainly different masses uh, because they also diff tend to differ in their general elaborateness in uh, in the first place. But you do certainly see a number of examples of masses by Mozart and, and some of the smaller ones by Haydn, where the trumpets and drums uh, can be used ad libitum. And so the uh, uh, so you can use them with or without. So they can be used for all you know, uh, archiepiscopal solemnity or for a lesser one. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the genesis of perhaps uh, Michael Haydn's most famous work, the Requiem pro defunto, Archiepiscopo Sigismundo. Can you tell us about how that um, work came about? Well, that work was composed because uh, in 1771, the Prince Archbishop Sigismund von Stratenbach, uh, who had hired Michael Haydn uh, earlier and who also employed Leopold Mozart and was patron to him and his young son Wolfgang, passed away suddenly, and uh, and there was a need for writing a, a, a requiem mass for him, and so uh, the piece that uh, so that that task fell to to Haydn, and he composed for it this uh, a very striking princely style requiem. So it includes all of the the, the full instrumentation. Uh, that you would expect for such such an occasion uh, for this sovereign prince, and uh, it, it's a uh, it's a work that he supposedly wrote very quickly because uh, historians have tended just to imagine that he started writing it right after the archbishop died, and it was ready by the time of the funeral mass or the uh, whichever mass it was it was required for, uh, and so uh, that. That you know we can't be too certain of, uh, but he had models in the Salzburg repertoire, and he also would have had his Viennese experience, having uh, sung as a uh, as a choir boy earlier in his life uh, for such events around the Viennese court. Uh, so it, he he had a a strong basis on which to build, even if the settings of the Requiem aren't as large a tradition as settings of. Of a solemn style orchestral masses more generally. Now, as for its uh, influence on on Mozart, which it's very well known for, uh, Mozart and and his father Leopold probably took part in the in that first performance of it, and they so they would have known it from the beginning, and perhaps performed it at at other uh, other funeral masses or perhaps on All Souls Day you know, along the way over the years. So it would have been a, a very uh, well-known piece and point of reference for Mozart. And indeed, that comes through in Mozart's Requiem, which has a lot of 
stylistic and formal parallels uh, with with Haydn's. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you hear the Michael Haydn, you think, oh my gosh, this is perhaps a version of the Mozart Requiem that's doable by my smaller choir. <laughs> it seems it seems much more approachable in um, not only scope, but complexity of especially the Fugato writing, et cetera. Certainly. So besides that mass, um, what are some other masses by Michael Haydn or other composers in this tradition besides Mozart and, and Haydn that you would recommend to people if they're looking to perform these masses, either in a liturgical context or for a concert context in their parish? That, that's a, a tough question because so many of the masses are elaborate and require uh, you know a, a very skilled set of performers, especially the vocal soloists and the trumpet players. Uh, but there are you know, still a number of masses that are are quite accessible. Uh, one I I often think well, let me start with with uh, one of the pieces that is that doesn't fall within that uh, solemn style trumpets and drums, you know, full type of mass. Uh, and that is that these uh, works that Michael Haydn uh, composed uh, for uh, performance by mainly by the boys' choir in Salzburg, uh, and so they're three-part treble voice masses, so I believe, soprano, soprano, alto, basically. Oh, that's great. And these, there are two such masses, and he also wrote Vespers for them, because he did this for their uh, celebrations of the Feast of the Holy Innocents. And they're really lovely pieces uh, that have nice, you know, transparent style, charming orchestral writing and and very uh, graceful you know, vocal writing. M Michael Haydn w was uh, famous for writing a nice lyrical line and being able to combine combine that with with a good sense of, of counterpoint along the way. Uh, so that that's those are masses that I uh, that that I think can be performed pretty well. And uh, it's been a while, but I have heard them in a in a parish liturgy, or one of them, the uh, Missa, well, the uh, Missa Sancte Leopoldi, the, the Saint Leopold Mass, which was written for this occasion. Uh, that's that's a pretty well known example. Now, as far as the the big grand masses with trumpets and drums, uh, a piece I often think about as as accessible because it's it's fairly compact. Uh, is a, a piece called the Missa Sancti Francici Serafici, and its its catalog number is MH119B. And I point that out because Michael Haydn also wrote towards the end of his life a, another Missa uh, Sancti Francici Serafici, but this was written for uh, the Emperor of Francis in Vienna in the uh, around 1803. Uh, and that's a much more elaborate mass it, that's more demanding. And but, but this earlier work is just a really good example of the trumpets and drums and and orchestra solemn style uh, in Salzburg. And it's one that the evidence reflects that it it was used specifically for for occasions on which the Prince Archbishop celebrated mass. And uh, uh, it demonstrates a very sensitive handling of the 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 text, the rhythm, and and the organization of the text, and it's it's got a really uh, bright and celebratory tone about it. Now that that kind of though, if if I can digress there for a moment, it it brings us back to the the matter of style and propriety because I th I think it's a really good example of this kind of mass, but it also demonstrates some of the the stumbling block <laughs> uh, because it uh, it it's a it's a really as I mentioned upbeat and festive piece from the very beginning the Kyrie is is really boisterous and it it sounds very overture like uh, but still very choral and you know, one of the uh, the criticisms of uh, of the style that uh, extends from its time uh, but probably even more so in later times in, in the 19th century and in the 20th century is that the uh, 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 the style is incongruous with the words of the mass at the time at, at certain times and especially uh, in the Kyrie because you know anybody you know thinking that a Kyrie should have a, a more sober style or represent the sense of meditation or reflection are quite often upset with the way uh, a Kyrie begins like this with a sense of fanfare 
you know, almost like a, an opera overture, as I mentioned. Uh, so one has to uh, kind of reorient, you know, the way you hear such a piece and realize, uh, once again, as I mentioned before, that the, the composers of this time were ennobling the words of the Mass with uh, a style that was contemporary and but understood still in their time as a very high and serious style. And and also that the the, the text was in a sense, being celebrated rather than being represented. Uh, and that's really the, the best way to get into these pieces uh, and, and to get, get over the fact that uh, sometimes it, certain sections of, of a work like that may seem too lighthearted, but that these were very familiar texts to those who were hearing them. And uh, the, the the musical representation of this kind of mass was was often one of celebration. This has been very helpful, Eric. Thank you so much for enlightening us about all these finer distinctions. And so I hope that our listeners will go into a a further study of this with some clarity about the differentiations and distinctions that need to be made in order to really enjoy this repertoire and to be able to think critically about its use in the liturgy. All right. You're very welcome. I'm very glad to to share these, uh, uh, these things with you. We hope you've enjoyed listening to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast with Dr. Jennifer donaldson Novitska. For more information about this episode, sacred music resources, or upcoming events, visit our website at sacredmusicpodcast.com. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoy our podcast, please write us a review on iTunes. This improves our iTunes ranking and helps others find out about the podcast. The music you heard at the beginning of this episode is Hec Dies by William Byrd, sung by the London Oratory Schola Cantorum Boys Choir, directed by Charles Cole from the CD Sacred Treasures of England. The music at the conclusion of this podcast is from the Prelude and Fugue in G Major, BWV 550 by Johann Sebastian Bach, performed by Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. We look forward to having you join us next time. And until then, may we sing the praise of his glory. <laughs>